Fred Winston Smith is re required to routinely consign writings, both significant and insignificant, to the oblivion of the memory holds. Now on reflection, I remember that at one point in my career, near the conclusion of a bloody controversial war that had torn America apart, a war that I had covered since the beginning, I faced my own memory hole. In this case, it was a fiery furnace into which I was ordered to consign the complete raw file of the Associated Press's field coverage of the Vietnam War to the years 1962 to 1972. We're talking here of millions of words, the product of labors by the dozens of professional reporters, mainly Americans, sent to the war theater over those years. I didn't do it. By concealment, deception, yes, lying, I saved the files for history. Methods I'm sure George R. Warwell would have approved. <laughs> but now for some background, a quick background on the war. Important policies of Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon involving Vietnam were carefully concealed from the American public. To maintain this deception, the media policies of all three presidents attempted heavy-handed news manipulation and intimidation of reporters in the field and their superiors back home. The objective to proceed with actions in Vietnam that if publicly debated would meet resistance at home and concern abroad. These leaders endeavored to compel powerful news industry leaders with its long tradition of war reporting to bend to the whims of policy makers, making questionable judgments on issues important to the American public, judgments often made far from the battlefields. In earlier significant American wars, the government, with official censorship, took upon itself the burden of deciding what news was fit to print, what information gathered by reporters in the field might harm the security of military operations, and also to keep on message in terms of achieving the overall objectives and keeping the support of the public at large. But that was in previous wars, not for the war in Vietnam, an enterprise deemed politically sensitive by far, too politically sensitive to justify censorship. So from the beginning, as early as June 1962, when I arrived assigned to the Saigon Bureau, a young man with a full head of hair, <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm, so from the beginning, when I arrived in June 1962, in, 19, in June 62, there were the beginnings of a credibility gap that only worsened as the years went by, and it's still being argued what that war was all about. Now, I soon learned what war was covering, what covering war was all about from my colleague and bureau chief, Malcolm Brown, a New York City native, and a graduate from an Ivy League college who handed me a pamphlet he had handwritten, a short guide to news coverage in Vietnam. <laughs> I followed his instructions, and as you can see here, me standing in the balcony of my Saigon apartment <clears throat> with the clothing and equipment for my war reporting assignment, all purchased, by the way, in the Saigon black market. We got no cooperation from the military. Now what do we have here? Two dozen items, all to be carried in the field. A camouflage mosquito net, canteen with case, a rubber air mattress, and ground sheet, a light blanket, jack knife, and assorted canned goods, several changes of underwear and socks, toilet paper, small flashlight, first aid kit, water purification tablets, Aspirin, a suitable plastic map, money and identification papers, condoms, and a pocket pistol, optional. <laughs> All to be put into an infantryman's field pack. Now, condoms, what? <laughs> now, on the battlefield, Malcolm Brown told me they were the best thing to carry exposed film in the paddy fields and jungle because they're waterproof. Of course, those were the days before digital photography. 
I and most other young reporters in Vietnam had benefited from military training during our draft years, but that was between wars. Vietnam was the real thing, and I soon felt ready to head out into the field. This is me with all my gear on. Mel Brown's instruction guide had some good pointers for combat coverage. He wrote, quote, the whole idea of covering a military action is to get to the news and pictures, get the news and pictures back, and not to play soldier yourself. He said you should know how to swim. Canals and ditches are often above your head. Lie prone under fire and move only on your belly. And here am I doing that, prone under fire and moving on my belly with an American unit. Look for cover and move toward it, which is exactly what I'm doing here. Other advice when moving with troops, do not stay close to the head of a column or the point man in a formation. That's right up front. There are a lot of others ahead of me in this picture. Professional soldiers are paid to do that, to go up front. Do not stand or march close to a radio man or medic because they're prime targets of the enemy. Here's some more advice from Mel. Try to keep in good physical condition so you can march or run for a reasonable distance. You may save your life by doing this at some point. He said, if you hear a shot and think it's not from your own side, don't get up to look around to see where it came from. <laughs> the second shot might get you. When possible, step in exactly the same spot as the soldier ahead of you. If he wasn't blowing up, you probably would be. Do not pick up Viet Cong flags or other souvenirs from haystacks. They may be booba trapped by grenades. One other point, beware of water buffalo. When they get excited, they stampede, charge, and kill. Don't be misled by seeing children playing on their backs. Children and buffaloes are friends. And finally, his advice was, stick close to the commander who is generally in the safest position available. And you'll learn from him than most of the others anyway. So that's what I'm doing in this picture. But a sad note, the Lieutenant Colonel I'm walking beside here in August of 1965, William Lethwich. He was the Assistant American Advisor to a Vietnamese Marine Battalion. It was a good friend. He died five years later in a helicopter crash in Vietnam when he returned for his uh, second tour. Now we wrote our stories on personal office typewriters, and this is what pages look like from the war zone era. Wow. Wow. Now they're pretty flimsy. Okay. This is a story I wrote in 1968, and I'll explain later how we found But here it is. Journalism circa the 60s. Not like that anymore. Very flimsy, very fragile, distinctive type two. On, uh, I use a little Latera 22 Olivetti portable. Uh, these pages are from the bottom carbon copy of a book of four we always use to type out our stories in the Saigon Bureau. After editing, one copy would be sent to the telex room for punching on tape to our New York headquarters. A second would stay on the Bureau news desk for immediate reference and a third to the bureau chief's office. All would eventually be discarded. This one, or these, this one that I showed you, these ones, they would be filed in a binder along with the rest of the day's stories and message traffic. By the end of the war, there were scores of these thick binders. And you will see a couple of them maybe on the desk of the office at one point on our crowded news desk. Now, at the beginning, Vietnam was a patriotic war, or that is how the military high command saw it, and suggested that the press be on the team. Typically, a story I wrote in July 24, 1962, angered U.S. officials because I reported that American armed helicopters firing machine guns and rockets had come to the aid of a trapped South Vietnamese ranger unit under attack by the Viet Cong. 
At that time, American soldiers were supposed to be just advisors to the Vietnamese, not directly involved. A story revealed how that role was changing into a combat one. How did I get the story? Some of the pilots were my friends, such as this crew chief on this plane. Now, the U.S. Embassy complained that this story and others like it were damaging to secret policies aimed at winning the war. President John F. Kennedy even tried to get David Helberstam of the New York Times, then a young reporter I worked with, reassigned out of Vietnam because of his critical stories. American editors were getting from us a unique, a, a unique look at a nation of war in the jungles and on the streets through uncensored stories and photos. And even though they generally supported America's policies there in the early years, reporters also and editors also strenuously defended press freedoms. An example of that is a letter to President Kennedy on, on June... Oh, okay, we'll get to that in a minute. A letter to President Kennedy on 18... Uh, July 1963 from the president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, Edward Drucker, editor of the Orange Harper Courant, spelled out the support. He said, quote, there have been complaints over a long period that American reporters are hampered by the South Vietnamese government in going about their duties, and sometimes even American officials do not support their efforts to report events as they are. It is not yet certain that all possible efforts are being made to prevent further deliberate obstacles to press freedom. He continued, whatever the difficulties, we urge you to bear in mind the need of the American people to have the fullest possible factual information from South Vietnam, no matter what anyone may think is right or wrong about the situation. Good letter for us. For the reporters, though, the pressures on the streets of Saigon continued as a developing protest by Vietnamese leaders threatened the stability of the Catholic-led government of No Dinh Diem, supported by the U.S. This picture by Malcolm Brown, taken in mid-1963, of the protest self-immolation of an aged monk, Quang Duc, on the streets of Saigon, uh, brought Vietnam to the attention of the world and police attention to the correspondence. The Buddhists were protesting the policies of the government. In this photo, I'm arrested along with an Australian cameraman, Peter Herford, and held for several hours after attending a Buddhist rally. A few weeks later, I was attacked by plainclothes police at another rally, thrown to the ground and kicked. You can see me on the left of the picture with my bloody face. I was fortunately rescued by the brawny David Helberstam, who challenged the peace to continue attacking me. And that's David standing in front. Those first years of the war set the course for news coverage of the whole Vietnam conflict. The U.S. government continued to reveal as little as possible of the politics behind, policies behind the war, emphasizing the positive, but reporters and photographers at least were free to travel with the troops and tell the story as they saw it. There were some discordant moments here an American military policeman in 1966 in Saigon is holding a gun on me and some other reporters, including young Bob Sheeper, then of the Dallas Morning News and later a famous CBS anchorman. We were just trying to cover a Buddhist protest, and the soldier was trying to stop us, and which he had no authority to do. The picture was published in the Washington Post the following morning, resulting in a directive of, from Secretary of State being rushed to the Saigon Embassy not to let it happen again. Under President Lyndon Johnson, the war began widening to the dimensions of a major conflict in 1965. But even as hundreds of thousands of Americans entered the battlefields, there was no censorship of the press. This did not mean that pressure on said journalists was not powerful. President Johnson wanted the media to affect what he himself was unwilling to do. He wanted an unofficial censorship that would shape news dispatches 
to conform with his view of how the war should be proceeding. And the president did not hesitate to arm twist reluctant editors at home for them to get on the team. We were told by friendly US officials in Saigon that President Johnson was our most avid antagonist brooding over the media's depiction of the war in front of a row of television sets in the White House, tuned to the network newscast, and checking up on the three telex machines, clicking out the product of the AP, UPI, and Reuters from Vietnam and elsewhere. My favorite story about the AP's relationship with Lyndon Johnson comes from Wes Gallagher, who was the president of the organization. I, uh, one day the president had complained to two visiting managing editors from AP member newspapers about my coverage specifically in Vietnam and complaints which they passed on to the AP. Now this was early in 1966 and it happened that Gallagher, our president, and Johnson were going to meet for lunch the following day. Now, they were both formidable men, both were tall and tough-minded. And with the luncheon ending and, and nearing an end with no mention of the war, Gallagher said, Mr. President, I understand you've been critical of some of the AP stories from Vietnam. Oh, no, the president replied. I think the AP is doing a great job. Not willing to challenge the president on what had been reported the day before by the managing editors, Gallagher said, well, I just want you to know, Mr. President, that the AP is not against you or for you. And he, the Johnson replied, that's, just, that's not quite just the way I like it. <laughs> Didn't like it. Now, in a visit to Saigon well into the war at that time, when my reporting was often challenged, and there was pressure from the White House to send me home, AP, the Al Gallagher told me that he supported what I was doing. He said, Peter, don't make any mistakes. If you do, you're out. No mistakes. Journalists unintentionally make them all the time. My solution was to continue covering the war by only what, reporting only what I personally witnessed and wrote analysis based on my own investigations. And in interviews with those, those I saw had the most perspective an experienced view of the war. That meant I covered almost every major military action in the country, from the consequential Battle of Ap Bak, the first of the war in January of 1962, to the fall of Saigon in April 1975. To cover the war, I needed contacts. I made the personal acquaintanceship of this man, Daniel Ellsberg, first when he was a hawkish whiz kid working for Secretary of Defense Rick McNamara, as seen in this picture, and later as the dovish author of the famous Pentagon Papers. I spent several days with Major Norman Schwarzkopf when he was a ranger advisor at the besieged Duco camp in the Central Highlands in 1965. This is a picture I took of him uh, helping a wounded uh, Vietnamese ranger at the Duco camp, and uh, he kept a copy of this on his desk for years. Another source important to me, John Paul Van, famous from Neil Sheehan's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of him, A Bright Shining Lie. Van was smart, fearless, challenged authority, my kind of guy. He also wanted South Vietnam to survive as an independent country as he had helped South Korea in the previous decade. He was my most enlightened source from the time I met him in the Mekong Delta in 1962, right up to a week before his death in a helicopter crash near Kantum in 1972. And I just mentioned General Fr Frederick Wyand when he arrived in command of the 25th Infantry Division operating in the Kuchi region West of Saigon, he turned out to be a very reasonable, pleasant man. I won his trust and friendship during the later tours of duty, his latest tours as the last commander, and finally as the last chief of American forces in Vietnam. 
Now for some action. 